The next phylum that we're going to talk about is phylum mollusca, or the mollusks. And we've talked a little bit about mollusks so far, uh, because remember they were one of the hosts in our phylum platyelminthes class Trematoda. So just to very quickly kind of show you where they are in this phylogenetic tree, we are in metazoa, eumetazoa, we are in the bilateral organisms which are going to have a body cavity, we are in protostomes, and then we are in Lophotrochozoa, and then finally our mollusks. And again, as a review, Lophotrochozoa is a superphylum. So um, we have Lophotrochozoa, so superphylum Lophotrochozoa, phylum mollusca, uh, and then we're going to talk about some classes uh, within this phylum. Um, so these include, like this comic is showing, it includes things like snails, um, as well as slugs. They are not the same organism. Uh, they are different organisms, though they are very closely related to one another. So here we have a couple of different examples, uh, representative examples of different classes of our mollusks. So for example, we have things like octopi. Um, we have other organisms like these mussels that have two shells. We have things with one shell, um, like this snail. But despite the wide variety of organisms in phylum mollusca, they do have um, some common characteristics. So first of all, all of these organisms are exhibiting bilateral symmetry. They have a clear left and right half. So looking at this squid, for example, we definitely have a left and right half here. Um, these shelled organisms, I mean, really their shell itself is a left and right half. If the snail was facing towards us, we could identify that bilateral symmetry. Because they have bilateral symmetry, they are a triploblast. They do have three germ layers. And the way those three germ layers are organized is they have a true body cavity. Remember a true body cavity, we have our ectoderm, we have our endoderm, and then we have some sort of opening. This isn't gonna be the best picture, but some sort of opening or a coelom or a body cavity that is completely lined with mesoderm. So they are a eucoelomate organism. These guys do have complete digestion, so they do have two openings, a mouth and an anus. And these guys are still protostomes. So during that embryonic development, it is the mouth that is forming first before the anus. So again, this is going to be true of all mollusks. But in addition to these characteristics that help us to describe mollusks, we also have other common characteristics found uh, within this phylum. So all of our mollusks, and there's a picture of this on the bottom of the screen, all of our mollusks have a muscular foot. What we mean by muscular is that there's muscles in it. For example, insects do not have a muscular foot, right? They don't have muscles uh, within their legs and within their feet, uh, but these guys, they do. Now, what that foot looks like really depends on the organism, depends on which mollusk we're talking about. So the pink color in this image is talking about the foot. And the foot, as the name kind of suggests, is used for locomotion. So when the snail, pretty much the part of the snail we see, that's its foot, that's what it's using to move. On a squid or an octopi, its face and all of its tentacles are just a modified foot, but again, used for that locomotion. A clam, that kind of muscly part that you might eat, that can actually come out of the shell, uh, and it does come out of the shell, and it helps it to move. Uh, so all of these mollusks have this muscular foot, even though it might look different between species. All of our mollusks also have a structure called the visceral mass. The visceral mass is where all of the organs are found. In the picture here, it doesn't quite show you the visceral mass. Um, it's showing you the gills, it's showing you the digestive tract. Um, those two things from these pictures, those two things would be part of the visceral mass. Um, so it's almost an enclosed region of the body where you're finding all of the organs, including reproductive organs, things used in respiration, things used in digestion. All of these are found a sac isn't quite the right word, but you can almost imagine that you have one central area where all of these organs are found. 
And then finally, um, all of these organisms have something referred to as a mantle. Um, and this mantle is on the epidermis, so it's on the outer layer of the organism. And this is where the shell is built. So thinking about a snail, um, this is where that really hard um, structure of the cell, sorry, of the shell is developing from. If you think about a clam, again, that hard shell was from this mantle area. Now a squid or an octopus that have a very soft shell, uh, they're quite flexible, they still have a mantle cavity, right? But their shell just isn't as hard as say a clam or a snail, but they still have this mantle cavity. And the whole point of this mantle area is to provide protection uh, for that organism, whether it's through a hard shell or a soft shell, um, it's there to provide this protection. And so again, all of our mollusks, no matter what kind of mollusk we're talking about, all of them have these three common characteristics uh, that tie them all together. So let's talk about our first class. Um, you have probably seen a lot of these organisms, but maybe you're not sure of what their names are. So let's look at class bivalvia. And here's that root bi, and we know bi refers to two. Valvia actually does not refer to shells. Um, it refers to valves, which these organisms have in order to suck in water and suck out water or push out water. And what these bivalves do is they're filter feeders. They're not going out and trying to hunt things, but instead they're taking in water. They're going to pull out um, algae, phytoplankton, zooplankton. They're going to pull out bacteria that's in that water and eat it. And then all the extra stuff, they just blow out of them. They just um, push that out of their body. So these guys are filter feeders. So let's identify some of the bivalves that are on this screen. So in the top right, we've already seen this image, uh, but this is a clam. Uh, we've also already looked at mussels. That actually might have one L, I'm not sure. Uh, down here are oysters. And this seashell, usually everyone identifies it as, oh, it's a seashell, but there was an animal that was part of this seashell. Um, some of you guys may have had this animal before. These are scallops. And so I'm actually gonna pause real quick because scallops are like the coolest thing ever. So the video that's at the top of this page is related to the scallops. Um, so go ahead and pause here. It's like a 20 second video. Uh, but you, but you need to watch it. Um, so go ahead and pause here. There's a link popping up above me. Click that, go view that video real quick and come back. Right, so crazy the way the scallop moves uh, and, and very unique in the bivalves. Most bivalves are stationary in the sense that they kind of get anchored to a location and they stay there. Uh, but that's not the case with scallops, uh, which makes it kind of cool. Now the second video that's on here down at the bottom is related to oysters. I mean, us living right near the Chesapeake Bay, um, oysters have a huge impact on our economy, um, a positive impact on our economy when we have them. But there's been a huge issue with over harvesting of our oysters, as well as a lot of other organisms in the bay, such as blue crabs. Now, what this video is showing you is the impact particularly oysters have on the environment specifically with their filter feeding. So what oysters do that's a little bit different than the other type of bivalves is when they take in water, when they suck in that water, some of the water that gets sucked in is, is dirt, right? And the oyster doesn't want that, the clams don't want that. But instead of the oyster just pushing that dirt out with the water, which is what most of the other ones do, instead what it does, if you guys have ever had a fish and you've ever seen a fish poop, it's like, this really dense little string of poop. That's what oysters do. They combine all of the stuff they didn't want. Uh, they take all the dirt and sediment and things they didn't want to eat. And instead of just pushing it into the environment and mixing it with water, they condense it into, we'll call it poop. It's not quite poop, but we'll call it poop. It says really, really nice and condensed. And then the oyster takes it out. And because it's a lot denser, it doesn't mix with the water. Instead, it just falls to the water bottom. So all of that cloudiness in this water is now being transformed into 
little pellets of sediment that then get rested on the ocean floor. And so oysters have an incredibly important ecosystem service in the fact that they are filtering the water. This makes it so other organisms can see. We as humans, we appreciate this because this is clean water for us to drink and for us to swim in and for us to fish in. You shouldn't drink it straight up, but it's much easier to clean when it's already clean to begin with. So we're going to go ahead and pause in just a moment. I want you to go watch this video. It's not that long, but kind of showing you how powerful of a filter feeder oysters are and how important they are, not just to our economy, but to our environment. So go ahead and pause here. There is a video popping up. Go watch that and then come back here. All right. So that was class bivalvia. Uh, not, we focus a lot on oysters, but all of these species, we as humans rely on. You go to the store and you can buy these. You go to a restaurant, there's going to be dishes with them. Uh, so our economy really relies on bivalves.